So far then, we have seen oscillations in both the particle in a box problem and in the quantum version of the harmonic oscillator. But the harmonic oscillator we have seen so far does not correspond very well yet with the behavior of a classical harmonic oscillator. We don't see a single well-defined probability distribution moving smoothly from one side to another. Though the behavior of our probability distribution did oscillate from one side to another, it had various bumps in it and obviously changed shape as it oscillated. Of course, so far we've only constructed a very simple linear superposition of the first two levels of the harmonic oscillator, and we have many other kinds of superpositions that we could create. One particularly interesting one is what is called the coherent state. The history of this state goes back to Schrödinger in 1926, when he was trying to understand exactly this kind of correspondence between quantum and classical behaviors. The mathematics of the specific coherent state we are going to look at was developed in the 1960s by Roy Glauber and forms part of the modern quantum mechanical theory of lasers and coherent light. What we are going to do is simply to propose that we look at this specific linear superposition, and then we will calculate how it behaves. Somewhat magically, as we increase the overall energy in this coherent state, we progressively recover the kind of behavior we find in the classical harmonic oscillator, thus proving that there is a quantum mechanical state for an oscillator that does correspond to our classical experience. This is also a good example for us to look at to understand time-dependent behavior in quantum mechanical systems more generally. So let's formally construct this coherent state. The coherent state for a harmonic oscillator of frequency omega is this state. It's a linear superposition of harmonic oscillator wave functions, each with their corresponding time-dependent exponential factor and a specific set of coefficients. Now, this sum formally runs from n equals 0 to n equals infinity, but basically it's just a linear superposition of a collection of harmonic oscillator states, each of which we have correctly put the time-dependent factor in front of it, that is e to the minus i e over h bar t. That is, for the nth state, that's n plus a half h bar omega, that's the energy of the nth state, divided by h bar, of course, so we end up with n plus a half times omega, the frequency of the classical oscillator. And then we have these specific coefficients out here, and you'll note that there are two indices on these. There is the index corresponding to which harmonic oscillator state we're talking about, and then there's another parameter n that we will clarify in a minute. And there are different coherent states depending on what we choose for this capital N here. So the capital N is a parameter we choose for the coherent state. The small n is the index for which particular harmonic oscillator state we're talking about at a given time. And these coefficients here obey the following formula. And I'll clarify for you in a minute what this means in another context. But anyway, at the moment, all we're saying is for each given little n, each given harmonic oscillator state, and for our chosen value of this parameter capital N, here's how we calculate these coefficients. As I said, these psi n of c are the harmonic oscillator eigenstates. So... In this expansion, note that the modulus squared of these coefficients happens to have the following formula. And you might recognize that formula. This is the Poisson distribution from statistics. And in this case, it would have a mean n and a standard deviation root n. And the Poisson distribution, for example, if you are expecting on the average that you get capital N letters in the mail every day, so n Capital N doesn't have to be an integer, by the way. On the average, you might get 4.3 letters per day coming in the mail. Then this expression tells you the probability that on any given day, you get little n letters, presuming that the arrival of these letters is completely uncorrelated with one another. The people who are writing to you don't know that other people are writing to you. 
and they send their letters quite independently. So this would be the probability that if you get capital N letters per day, that little n letters arrive on a given day. That's what the Poisson distribution is in statistics. So we are going to make no direct use of the fact that these happen to be the Poisson distribution coefficients, these modulus squared. We're not going to use that here, but I just point it out. And in the end, for example, it does explain why when we're looking at, say, a laser beam, which does happen to be in its ideal form in a coherent state, the distribution of the arrival of the number of photons in a laser beam is something that obeys this distribution. So now, without justifying why classical harmonic oscillators are best represented by these coherent states, we're going to construct some examples and show the resulting oscillations. Note, incidentally, that the one parameter in the coherent state, which is that number, the capital N, the uppercase N, is not constrained to being an integer. It can have any real value. It is only representing a statistical average of some kind, not a quantum number. So let's look at some oscillations in the coherent state. We're taking our coherent state that we previously wrote down. Here it is with these coefficients, our eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator with their correct time oscillating factors in front with the formula that we've been talking about. And here we have the answer when we choose this capital N equal to 1. This is the probability density here and it's oscillating backwards and forwards and it's staying the same shape and executing what looks like a pretty good sinusoidal oscillation from side to side. As I said, this parameter does not have to be an integer. I happen to have chosen integers here. It can be any real number. Now, we see the oscillation, but this is still not a particle that is in a very well-defined position. There's obviously quite a width to this distribution here. But it is oscillating, but it's not a very well-defined position of particle. But we do notice that it's retaining its shape so we're seeing something that's looking much more like a classical oscillation here. And if we put this parameter up, then we may notice we're beginning to get a slightly narrower distribution here. It's still oscillating at the same frequency. Notice that as I go through these, I will be changing both the horizontal and vertical scales here. This particle is oscillating in a wider oscillation than the previous n equals 1 oscillation. And incidentally, to anticipate a little bit, this parameter n will in the end correspond to the total amount of energy in our oscillator in this coherent state. We'll come back to that issue later on. So that's for n equals 3, capital N equals 3. And here we have capital N equals 10. You can see quite clearly now the distribution is much narrower. The horizontal scale has expanded somewhat. The vertical scale has certainly also expanded in the way that I'm plotting this. And it's expanded because the state is getting narrower in space. The area, if we correctly normalize this, the area is not really changing because the area has to essentially integrate up to 1. The particle has to be somewhere. But because the distribution is getting narrower, then the height of the peak is getting higher. And finally, let's look at what happens when we go to n equals 100. So we've got a larger amplitude here of oscillation. The horizontal scale has changed quite a lot. And our peak is now quite a lot sharper. Notice this is really quite a nice sharp peak here going backwards and forwards. So this is really beginning to look quite like a classical oscillator, a relatively well-defined position for our particle, because we've got a narrow distribution here, and a sinusoidal motion back and forwards. So although we produce this coherent state sort of from nowhere, I just wrote it down as a possible superposition, this coherent state happens to pretty well emulate the behavior of a classically oscillating particle. So at least there is a quantum mechanical state that we can write down that does indeed reproduce the classical oscillations that we're used to. So we do have a correspondence that we can get from the quantum back to the classical.
I should say that there are many other superpositions we can create in quantum mechanics that are not particularly well linked back to what we see in the classical world, and that is ultimately one of the puzzles in quantum mechanics, why we more often see these states that do have the classical behavior and don't seem so often to see the states that don't. So, in each case for our harmonic oscillator in a coherent state, the probability distribution essentially oscillates back and forth from one side of the potential to the other with the angular frequency omega, clearly retaining essentially the same shape as it does so. For higher values of that parameter capital N, the spatial width of the probability distribution becomes a smaller fraction of the oscillation amplitude. For large n, the probability distribution will appear to be very localized relative to the size of the oscillation, therefore recovering the classical idea of oscillation. Therefore, as we said, we do have a quantum mechanical state, a specific linear superposition of the eigenstates called the coherent state, which does give us the behavior corresponding to the classical harmonic oscillator. Of course, again, as we said, in quantum mechanics, many other states are also possible with different superpositions. In general, a system in a linear superposition of multiple energy eigenstates does not execute a simple harmonic motion like this harmonic oscillator does. Of course, any linear superposition of two different states, such as the first two states of the particle in a box, will oscillate in some fashion at the frequency corresponding to the energy separation of the two states. But when we have a superposition of many states, we need equal spacing of the states in energy, which the harmonic oscillator has, or at least integer or rational ratios of the energy spacing, if we are to get cyclic behavior. The separations of the energy levels would all have to be integer multiples of some specific energy quantity. Harmonic, that is simple oscillatory motion, when we have a complicated superposition of a large number of states, as in the coherent state, is a special consequence of the fact that all the energy levels are equally spaced in the harmonic oscillator case. We can illustrate what happens when we don't have equal energy spacing by considering another example we can make a linear superposition of the first three states of a finite potential well. The energy separations there between the states are not in integer ratios. So let's look and see what happens if we superimpose some other states. What we're going to do here is we're going to make an equal linear superposition of the first three states of a finite potential well. So we remember, for example, the previous example that we worked through. We had energy eigenstates at 0.663 units of energy, another one at 2.603 units of energy, and these are all approximate numbers, and another one at 5.609 approximately units of energy. We remember the form of the various wave functions here. These are not in integer ratios. And because these energies are not rationally related, and they could be quite irrational numbers here, uh, real numbers that are not necessarily rationally related to one another, the superposition in that case never repeats itself. For example, here is the probability density in time that we could calculate for a superposition like that. And it keeps wiggling about all over the place, and it never repeats itself. Now we've seen oscillations and other time-dependent behavior for potentials in which we have confined states. We could see this by making superpositions of the energy eigenstates. But we don't yet understand what might seem like an easier problem, the propagation of particles through free space or uniform potentials. How can we model that? That will be the subject of our next section. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.